Hey there. Hi. What an absolute honor to help kick off South by Southwest EDU. It is exhilarating to think that our country's most passionate teachers, most promising educational entrepreneurs, leading grant makers and education publishers are all in this one huge tent right now. I am I'm super excited to be with you. I'm embarrassed uh, to admit this, but this is my first time in Austin. I haven't, haven't been here before. And I wanted to get a feel for this incredible city before speaking with you today. Last night, all the famous barbecue joints had lines like way, way out their doors. And uh, I was able to uh, get some enchiladas al pastor at a great Tex-Mex place. But I, I wanted to get really, really put my finger on the pulse of Austin. So I went to Kickstarter. How many of you have backed a project on Kickstarter over the last year? Raise your hand. All right, it looks like about 90% of the folks here. That's awesome. Of the $500 million of creative projects funded on Kickstarter last year alone, many of them were from people right here in Austin. That protein bar you see uh, is the brainchild of three Austin entrepreneurs, Marta, Jack, and John, who are setting out to save the planet by getting you and me to eat grasshoppers. That protein bar is made with insect flour, and uh, apparently it's delicious. Their, their, their venture is taking off, and they want to keep production here in Austin, for which they need a $30,000 packaging machine. And that's just what uh, 500 people from all over the country funded for those three Austin entrepreneurs. In the middle, you see the Enemies Project from a guy named Nelson Gouda. Nelson uh, flew all the way from Austin to South Sudan, where he did photo portraits and wrote profiles of people on opposing sides of the conflict who were finding a way to make peace. And he dreamed of creating a, a photography book and doing an exhibit at the United Nations after traveling to conflict zones all over the world. About 150 people gave Nelson $24,000 to make it happen. And on the right, you see something incredible. It's an image of the Austin Sanitation Department. There's a, a dancer in this city. Her name is Allison Orr. And she choreographed a garbage truck ballet with 24 employees of the Austin Sanitation Department. Uh, people flocked to see this incredible dance performance. Uh, they had to turn away hundreds and hundreds of people. So Allison decided that she would uh, do this a garbage truck ballet once more at the uh, airport tarmac in Austin so that 2,000 people at a time could see this show and make sure that it would be free for anyone who wanted to see what became known as trash dance. <laughs> now, only five years ago, these, these creative people, Marta and Jack and John, Nelson Gouda, Allison Orr, they would have needed a rich uncle, or industry connections, or years of working their way up the ladder before they could have done these projects. Kickstarter does away with all that. It lets you ask your friends and the world at large to support your creativity without any gatekeepers standing in your way. If your idea is awesome, it'll probably get funded. So after checking out uh, the, the Kickstarter uh, Austin offerings, I went to Etsy to learn more about this incredible city. How many of you have bought something on Etsy over the last year? All right, it looks like just as many of you. Uh, people bought $2 billion worth of handmade goods on Etsy last year alone. And one reason for that is that Austin crafters have 128,000 different items for sale on Etsy, such as uh, a wooden Triceratops wine rack and uh, moisturizing lotion for your dog's paws, which might get cracked as, as your dog walks down the street, uh, and a purse made from the book binding of To Kill a Mockingbird. Now, most of the folks who have crafts for sale on Etsy used to work office jobs all day, reluctantly. They really wanted to be crafting, but they could only do so as a, a hobby in their spare time. Few of these folks could have scored the investment that you need to make a prototype that a factory can manufacture, 
or persuade Macy's or Walmart to sell their product or raise millions of advertising dollars to get consumers to buy their product. That's a process which lets only a lucky few become designers. And of course, it's a, a process that can suck the personality out of your creation. And then Etsy came along. And now crafters can pursue their passion as their day job and sell their, their crafts to people all over the world. They don't have to break through all of the barriers that until recently stood in the way of anyone who wanted to make beautiful things for a living. So after checking out uh, what Austin has to offer on Kickstarter and Etsy, of course, uh, I went to donorschoose.org and I took a look at some of the 1,800 classroom project requests that Austin teachers have gotten funded through our site. On the left, you see a student in Mrs. Baker's classroom at Pioneer Crossing Elementary School, not far from here. Uh, this is a school which is seeing an influx of Vietnamese immigrants, and Mrs. Baker wanted to make sure that these students felt welcomed. So she requested funding for a classroom library of Vietnamese folk tales and books on Vietnamese history, and two people, one of them in Illinois, made her classroom dream come true. In the middle, you see students in Mrs. Longneck's classroom at Decker Middle School. She wanted her students to become beekeepers. She requested $500 of beekeeping equipment. Donors in five different states made her dream come true, and, and she just wrote that uh, her students were at first totally terrified of these bees, but now find them cute. They find the queen bee to be worthy of the utmost respect, uh, and they're fascinated that bees can create geometrically perfect hexagons and tell each other where a great flower patch is. And then on the right, uh, you see a teacher at the nearby high school for deaf and hard of hearing students. Uh, this, this teacher, Mrs. Pickens, saw that her students had a really hard time uh, watching the teacher, looking at the interpreter to see the signs that he was making, and taking notes all at once. So Mrs. Pickens requested three iPads so that her students could take notes really quickly, watching both the interpreter and the teacher, uh, and so that they could look up uh, uh, signs. They could use a, a, an online sign language dictionary and not have to interrupt class asking how to make the sign for a particular word. This was a $1,400 project that donors in three different states uh, made happen for Mrs. Pickens. At DonorsChoose.org, teachers go straight to the public with their best ideas for helping students learn. They don't have to first pay their dues or get the sign off of an administrator or fill something out in triplicate. In fact, there's nothing standing between their idea and a potential supporter. There's a change underway which I want to talk about with you this afternoon. It's a change in who you have to know, and how long you have to wait, and how lucky you have to be to bring a good idea to life. It's about a new kind of marketplace where gatekeepers do not stand in your way. DonorsChoose.org is a pioneer of this movement, so I want to tell you the inside story of how it launched, and that's going to include the most humiliating and embarrassing thing I've ever done. And then I want to explain how we think that crowdfunding could help to change the education system itself and how you can plug in to that effort. One last show of hands. How many of you had a teacher in high school who changed your life? Even more of you than bought something on Etsy and back to project on Kickstarter. That's awesome. I had a teacher like that. Here he is. His name was Mr. Buxton. He was my English teacher and my wrestling coach. And when I showed up as a dorky freshman in high school, Mr. Buxton spoke to me like he would to any adult. If he approved or disapproved of something I'd done, I knew it right away because he didn't have that mask that some grown-ups have when they're talking to kids. If I asked him a question on Wednesday, he'd come back to me on Friday saying that he'd thought about it, and he, he really had. He made you feel like he wanted you on his team. And looking back on it, I think it was Mr. Buxton who made me want to be a teacher. So 14 years ago, I started teaching history at Wings Academy, a public high school in the Bronx. But the school where I was teaching did not have the same resources as when I was in Mr. Buxton's classroom. Where I went to high school, we went on field trips into the woods. We had graphing calculators for trigonometry. We had the supplies to do just about any art project. We did not want for anything. But when I started teaching in the Bronx, I saw firsthand 
that all schools are not created equal. My colleagues and I would spend a lot of our own money on copy paper and pencils, and we would see our students going without many of the materials and experiences that they needed for a great education. We'd talk in the teacher's lunchroom about books that we wanted our students to read, and a field trip we wanted to take them on, and a pair of microscopes that we needed for a science experiment. What I wanted for my students was Little House on the Prairie. Those of you who uh, only saw the TV show might think I was dumbing things down, but those of you who read the book will remember that Little House on the Prairie is a gripping, unsentimental account of pioneer life. And my students, even those who had never left New York City, they loved it too. But the New York City public school system was not about to purchase uh, the Little House series for each of my students. So every day I would uh, get up uh, at dawn and I would go to the copy shop, open 24 hours a day, and I would make uh, copy, photocopies of that day's section of Little House on the Prairie, which uh, probably violated uh, all sorts of copyright laws. And as I was making photocopies, I started thinking about all those resources that my colleagues wanted for their students. And it occurred to me that there must be people out there who'd want to help teachers like us if they could see exactly where their money was going. So using pencil and paper, I, I drew out a website where public school teachers could create classroom project requests and donors could choose a project they wanted to support. For $2,000, a programmer who had recently arrived from Poland was willing to code my, my pencil and paper drawings. The version one of our site was super rudimentary. The back end was uh, one page that you'd have to scroll down for like 15 minutes to get to the teacher or the project that you were looking for. To process a donation, I had one of those black boxes that you see at the grocery store when they can't swipe your credit card and you, they type in the, the credit card number and the dollar amount and send it over a telephone line. So it was like PayPal, but by hand. It was a very good thing my students were helping me to get the site off the ground. And then I had to get my colleagues to try out this site and post the first projects. Now, I don't know how it is at the schools and foundations and companies where you work, but at the high school where I was teaching, if you wanted to get teachers to do something, you gave them free food. And what you see right there is my mom's roasted pear dessert. She makes these pears with orange rind, and apricot jam and spices, and let me tell you, they taste something delicious. So I brought 11 of my mom's roasted pears into the teacher's lunchroom, and as my colleagues prepared to pounce, I said, hold up, there's a toll. If you eat one of these pears, you have to go to this new website called donorschoose.org and ask for whatever it is you most want for your students. Propose the project that you've always wanted to do with them. Sounded like a pretty good deal. Took my colleagues like two minutes to scarf the 11 pairs, and then they proceeded to post the first 11 projects on our site. The health teacher, she was the first to eat the dessert, naturally, and she wanted to do uh, a pregnancy prevention project for which she needed Baby Think It Over dolls, which are uh, life-size, life-weight dolls that cry at three in the morning and need to be fed and show a teenager what their responsibilities would be were they to have a kid. Uh, the English teacher, he wanted to get his students ready for the SAT, so he requested test prep books. Art teacher wanted her students to do a wall-to-wall -wall quilt with each of her students sewing a square, and for that she needed fabric and thread and needles. The other history teacher and I wanted our students to meet Mokhtar Tayeb. He um, had escaped from modern-day slavery in Mauritania. The New Yorker had done a profile on him and, and his escape from slavery, and he'd been given asylum and was traveling the United States telling people that slavery still exists in many forms. Well, our students had just finished reading the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, and we thought how amazing it would be if our students could meet someone in the flesh who himself had escaped from slavery. So we put up a project on Donors Choose to bring in Mokhtar Tayeb, assigned our students that New Yorker profile, uh, and, and our students got to meet this man. Those were four of the first 11 projects up on our site. My aunt, who's a nurse, uh, funded the first project, but uh, I didn't know any more donors to fund the other 10 projects, so I funded them myself, uh, which I could, I, could, uh, I could afford to do because I was still living at home with my parents, and they weren't charging me any rent, so I could spare some of my teacher's salary to, to fund uh, my colleagues' projects. And because I donated anonymously, my colleagues mistakenly thought that the website actually worked. 
and that there were all these donors on the site just waiting to fulfill teachers' classroom dreams. That rumor spread across the Bronx, and teachers started posting hundreds of projects, projects that needed a whole lot more money than what I could afford by living at home with my parents. I was in a really tough spot, not knowing how I was going to get these projects funded. My students came to the rescue. They could see the potential of this experiment to change their lives at school. And I think they also felt bad for me. Uh, so for four months, they volunteered every day after school to spread word to potential donors. They addressed and compiled 2,000 letters by hand to people all over the country, telling them about this website where someone with $10 could be a classroom hero. We sorted the mail ourselves to get the cheapest postal rate, and every desk in my classroom represented a different region and was piled high uh, with envelopes. And then we carted the sorted letters to the post office and crossed our fingers. It worked. My students' letter writing campaign generated $30,000 in donations to projects on our site. We were off. Another year went by. More teachers in the Bronx created projects on our site. Donors funded some of them. And then 9-11 happened. And teachers at the schools beside Ground Zero started creating projects on our site to recover from the attacks on the World Trade Center. There was a math teacher whose students' calculators were sealed at the disaster site. Their classroom had been relocated to a basement, and she requested a new set of calculators. There was uh, an art teacher who wanted to bring in an artist from Afghanistan to do after-school workshops so that students could meet someone from that country and learn about that country's history. We, there was a, a project from a first grade teacher whose students had been saved by a particular group of firemen. And these first graders wanted to thank the firemen who had saved them by doing a musical performance in front of their fire ladder company. And for that, they needed musical instruments. There were hundreds of these projects related to 9-11. And I thought that local media would jump on this story. This was right when people yearned to participate in the 9-11 recovery effort. The Red Cross had almost too many blood donations to put to good use. And here was this direct way for people to help. But no reporter would give me the time of day. And I think I must have called 100 of them with, with no luck. So I figured I'd better aim higher. Holy Grail at the time was the New York Times. They had a reporter covering nonprofits and philanthropy. Her name was Stephanie Strom. I figured if we could get Stephanie Strom of the New York Times to do a story about our site, we would have a shot at big time impact. So I put together a package of materials and I mailed them off to Stephanie. I didn't hear back. So I called her up uh, three weeks later and, and she, was, she was nice, but she said that we were awfully small potatoes. She said, you know, if ever I'm doing a story about online charities, which at the time was a new concept, you know, maybe I'll, I'll kind of slip you into that list, but uh, I'm afraid you're not exactly newsworthy. Damn. So then I found a directory of the top people at Newsweek, and I called the senior editor there, Jonathan Alter. I called him first because uh, his last name started with A, so he showed up first in the alphabetical directory. And I, I called him during my lunch hour, and his assistant must have been out to lunch because he picked up the phone. And I said, hey, I'm a teacher up in the Bronx. I started this nonprofit with my students. Do you want to hear about it? And he said, sure. He didn't hang up on me. We talked for 45 minutes, and that night, he wrote a column for the Newsweek website saying that this experiment growing out of a Bronx classroom might one day change philanthropy. So then I called up Stephanie Strom at the New York Times, all excited. And I was like, hey, <laughs> Newsweek saw us as newsworthy, you know, at least for their website. So won't you give us a second look? And then she dashed my hopes. She said, I wouldn't touch your story with a 10-foot pole now that another reporter has covered you. The New York Times does not follow in the footsteps of other publications. Oh, I felt like an idiot for, for having told her that another media outlet had broken our story. So I wrote her an email apologizing for being so dumb. And Stephanie, could, Stephanie took pity. She could see how, how badly I felt. And she wrote back and she said, you know, you shouldn't feel, shouldn't feel quite so terrible because you didn't have a chance in the first place. <laughs> because her editors had asked her to focus on charities responding to 9-11. So there was my last opening. I crafted this email to Stephanie telling her about all 
all of the classroom projects that teachers beside Ground Zero were posting on our site focused on 9-11 recovery. And I called her up, I called her over the weekend, so I would go straight to voicemail, and I wouldn't interrupt her while she was on deadline, and I said, hey, this is the last time you'll ever hear from me if you could just read this one final pitch. Monday, I was back at school teaching, and I checked my email in between periods, and Stephanie had replied. She wanted to come do an interview for a major feature story in the New York Times. And let me tell you, it felt like the skies had opened. My, my parents raised me to be humble, but this was the New York Times, and I, I just had to shout. So I forwarded Stephanie's email to my friend, and I said, guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10-foot pole and now wants an interview? That's what hustling will get you. I beat my chest, I talked all kinds of smack, I, I, th I, I thought that I'd hit forward. <laughs> but, but, but I had hit reply. And the, the, the moment I realized I yanked the electrical cord from out of the socket to try and turn off the computer. But it was too late. I sent that trash-talking, guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10-foot pole email directly to Stephanie Strom, philanthropy reporter for the New York Times. <laughs> so naturally, I sent her another email apologizing for being so dumb. <laughs> and to Stephanie's eternal credit and mercy, she, she did not hold it against me. She went on to write uh, a feature story for the New York Times uh, saying that DonorsChoose.org might be the future of philanthropy. And since that time, we've, we've been working our tails off to, to try uh, and, and prove her right, to, to have earned her mercy. Uh, today, 63% uh, of all the public schools in America have at least one teacher who's created a project on our site. Million and a half people and partners have given over $300 million to projects on our site. So there are now 14 million students, most of them from low-income families who've got books, art supplies, field trips, technology, resources that they need to learn. My students and I, when we were working on this experiment in my classroom, we never dreamed that we would one day get to share numbers like these with folks like you at an event like South by EDU. And we sure as heck never dreamed that crowdfunding would become part of the zeitgeist. When DonorsChoose.org began, crowdfunding was years away from, from even being a word, and now it's a movement. Today there are hundreds of sites where people on the front lines can identify a need they see, propose a project they want to do, secure a microloan for a, a venture they want to start, and then anyone, no matter the size of their wallet, can become a patron, a financier, a philanthropist, and, and I'll wager that crowdfunding is only going to get bigger. Uh, I'll bet you that within the next five to ten years, crowdfunded projects and ventures will account for a real percentage of our country's GDP. So now I want to explain how we've made crowdfunding work in public schools. When a teacher submits a project for funding, we first make sure it's legit, and we email follow-up questions uh, if anything is unclear about what students are really going to learn. This school year alone, we'll get 250,000 classroom project requests, each of which has to be carefully vetted and reviewed. We used to pay people to do that work, and then we realized that our best teacher users were ready and willing to volunteer their time to vet other teachers' project requests. So now if you're a teacher and you've had 20 projects funded through our site and shown yourself to be an incredibly responsible, responsive teacher, we invite you to volunteer your time to review and authenticate other teachers' projects. Think of it as academic peer review meets Wikipedia. And now that we crowdsource this labor instead of paying people to do it, the time it takes us to vet and post a teacher's project has gone from 10 days when we were paying people to do this to one and a half days now that our, our best teacher users are, are volunteering to become our coworkers. That's the power of, of pushing intelligence out to the edge, of seeing your, your, your so-called beneficiaries as your coworkers, which is what crowdfunding is all about. So now the project's up on donorschoose.org. At any given moment, there are about 40,000 project requests live on our site. That's a lot to choose from. So we encourage donors to express a personal passion 
and look at the projects that match that passion. A few years ago, a writer for Fortune magazine was doing a story on Kiva and DonorsChoose.org as the two websites that Fortune thought were going to uh, shake up philanthropy. And when I was done talking with this writer, he seemed decently impressed by our site, but he said that his personal passion was saving the salmon in the Pacific Northwest, which is a nice way of saying he probably wouldn't be contributing to our site because education wasn't quite his cause. But before he left the room, I did a keyword search for salmon in the Northwest, and up came five projects uh, matching. The, the second project, second result was uh, from a teacher in Oregon who had created a salmon hatchery in the river flowing by his school, and he needed hip waders for his students to maintain and build out the hatchery. Top result was a project from a teacher on an island off Alaska, teaching in a one-room schoolhouse. She wrote in her project essay that she was 45 minutes away from the nearest store by airplane, and her students are native Alaskans, and they had recorded their parents' folk tales about salmon and done research on salmon and wanted to share that work with the outside world for which they needed a printer and a scanner. So here was this guy who had a passion for salmon and five projects to choose from. And as a result, uh, those high school kids in Oregon now have the hip waders they need uh, to go into the river and build out their salmon hatchery. Last part of the donors choose.org process is the, the best part. Um, when uh, a project is funded, we don't give the teacher cash. Uh, instead, we purchase the resources and have them delivered to the classroom. So even if the project is for therapeutic horseback riding for disabled students, we're paying the horseback riding stable, which provides that service. And then every donor, even if they've given just $1, gets photos of their project in action, a thank you note from the teacher, an impact letter from the teacher describing what students are, are really learning, and a cost report showing how every dollar was spent. Donors who give $50 or more also get handwritten student thank you letters. Our, our donors get to kind of see and feel the impact that they've had and even correspond with the classroom that they chose to help. Throughout this process, we try to be totally transparent. I'll give you one example. Once in a while, uh, the classroom isn't able to provide those student thank you letters. Internally, we call this a jilted donor situation. It happens about 2 or 3% of the time. And when it happens, we reach out to the donor and acknowledge that we've fallen short, even though they've probably forgotten that they were ever due a thank you package in the first place. And we offer to fund another project of their choice on our dime. Now, it might sound like a, a fall on your sword kind of thing to do, uh, but most of our donors are blown away that we would proactively apologize for not providing that thank you package. And very few of them take us up on our offer of funding another project for them. But our apology note does often prompt them to make a whole new donation. We once looked at the numbers and concluded that uh, our biggest revenue driver, biggest driver of donations, was screwing up and admitting it. <laughs> now, you, you've been kind in, in letting me share some, some uh, uh, anecdotes and uh, uh, human interest stories, and there are some folks out there who think that that's all donorschoose.org and crowdfunding are good for. So, you know, some individual points of light, some, some cute one-to-one -one connections, some good Samaritan deeds, but nothing that's going to change the system itself. A lot of traditional uh, uh, policy wonks look at our site and they ask, where's the beef? They even uh, worry that our site might let government off the hook by letting private citizens step in when the system is falling short. They might even call us a Band-Aid solution because we're, we're treating just the symptoms and not the causes. Well, this afternoon, I want to respond to that skepticism, because I think there are three ways that we could help to change the system itself, three ways that we could have an impact far beyond the books and art supplies and field trips that we deliver, and each of those ways is one that you can plug into to achieve some of your educational and business objectives. First way we think we could change the system itself is by helping entrepreneurs and inventors, and I suspect there are many of those in this room right now, to introduce new products and services directly to classroom teachers. Now, my, my sense is that for a long time, at least, until a few years ago, a lot of entrepreneurs and inventors um, saw K-12 uh, education not as a market where the best product wins. Instead, they would see 12,000 different school district procurement officials 
and a California and Texas state commission that you had to navigate and a system where you needed to hire a force of salespeople and lobbyists if you wanted to get your device, your, your service, your product adopted. And so a lot of entrepreneurs and inventors would turn their energies to other sectors. But now, entrepreneurs and inventors can use our site to directly reach teachers and circumvent the educational industrial complex. I've got two examples right here, and I'll be super impressed. You can just shout this out. Uh, can folks uh, uh, recognize what these two devices are? 3D printer. What about the second one? OK, this is the first time I've ever spoken where somebody could guess it. Pro please speak to me afterward. I want to give you a prize. Uh, <laughs> So indeed, the first image is of a MakerBot 3D printer. And there was a $2 million match offer on our site not long ago for any teacher in a low-income community who was requesting a 3D printer. I remember one teacher whose project uh, centered on teaching her students about the making and the manufacturing and the prototyping of synthetic limbs for wounded warriors. And indeed, you are right. On the, on the right is an image of an open ROV, open source, underwater robot for which there was an, also a, a match offer on our site for any teacher who wanted to request that device and take their students 12,000 leagues under the sea. Maybe not quite that deep, but deep enough to uh, experience an aquatic ecosystem that they might not otherwise experience. The Open ROV has a, a video camera and a remote control so that students can explore the ocean depths. Now, MakerBot and Open ROV are two companies that I think would never contemplate hiring a sales force to break into K-12 education. But by using our site, they've been able to introduce 3D printing and underwater exploration to hundreds of thousands of students from low-income communities. And we think that more entrepreneurs and inventors may want to use the same strategy. Second way we think we could change the system is by opening up all of our data. Quarter million teachers at 63% of all the public schools in America have created 700,000 project requests on our site. So we've now got statistical significance for the kinds of resources that teachers most need uh, in different cities and states and communities. We can see what books Austin teachers think are most effective at getting kids hooked on reading, as expressed by the book projects that they're creating on our site. We can see what technology devices crowdfunding, we call philanthropy. Give you a couple uh, fun examples. They found that women uh, donate to classroom project requests over the whole course of the school year, unprompted by any special day, whereas men tend to donate to classroom projects on holidays. And so our only hypothesis here was that uh, altruism comes naturally to women, whereas men need an external stimulus to, to remind them to be philanthropic. I'm not gonna ask Leos and Cancers to raise their hands because your cohort not only makes smaller donations but gives less frequently. <laughs> Aries and Taurus, uh, thank you for your larger than average donations but we hope that you will give more frequently than you do. Are there Capricorns in the room who'd like to raise their hands? All right, awesome. You, uh, for whatever reason, and we do not have any explanation, make larger than average uh, donations and you give more frequently. Congratulations, Capricorns. Getting a little more substantive, this is an analysis of the 103,000 book projects created on our site in aggregate, and the short of it is if you have a or nephew or a son or a daughter or a student between the ages of eight and 13, make sure that they've got diary of a wimpy kid. Last analysis I'll show you is of the impact of the recession on low-income versus upper-income classrooms. Now, what we found is that after the recession hit, teachers in low-income communities started submitting five times more projects for essential materials like copy paper, pencils, uh, dictionaries, as compared to the proportion of requests for enrichment materials like butterfly cocoons or uh, a field trip to Washington, D.C. Whereas in upper income communities, the recession led to no such increase in the proportion of requests for essential versus enrichment materials. What the data shows is that the recession has had a terribly disparate, regressive impact on public schools, leaving teachers in low income communities without 
uh, the materials for their students uh, to learn, whereas students and teachers in upper income communities, which I'm sure are still struggling, nevertheless are stocked with the, the basic essentials. This is just a, a scratching at the surface, but our dream here is to give voice to classroom teachers, whom we think know their students better than anybody else in the system. And if we can uh, listen to them by way of this data, we, we can hear what they're trying to tell the powers that be as to the resources they most need, the topics that are trending, the activities that are most effective. Third uh, and final way that we think we could help to change the system itself is politically uh, the spiciest. Internally, we call it a third way on teacher performance pay. It began a couple years ago when we were uh, lucky enough to win the Google Impact Award, which gave us a $5 million grant that we used to underwrite donors choose classroom funding credits that we gave to high school teachers who launched and helped their students pass math and science advanced placement courses. The key part of this was that uh, every student in one of these participating classrooms who passed their math or science AP exam unlocked $100 of donors choose classroom funding credits for their teacher. So if you're one of these teachers and 20 of your students pass the calculus AB exam, you get a $2,000 funding credit to spend on your own classroom projects or on your colleagues' classroom projects. The results from this were exciting enough. Teachers launched in low-income communities. Teachers launched 500 new math and science AP courses. And those results uh, compelled uh, uh, another grant so that we could take this same approach with girls learning to code. So for a few months last year, any public school teacher in America could unlock $1,000 of donors choose classroom funding credits if and when four of their female students demonstrated proficiency in computer science fundamentals using either Khan Academy or Code Academy or another module on code.org. Now, this might sort of look like, smell like, sound like merit pay because it's a financial reward commensurate to student learning outcomes, but by switching the currency with which the reward is paid from cash money to classroom funding credits, we've created something completely different. We're speaking to teachers' hearts rather than to their wallets and just saying, if you do something awesome with your students, we want to reinvest to make your classroom even more vibrant and double down on all the great stuff that you're clearly doing. And you can imagine the dynamic for students who can say, you see that classroom library? I got that for our classroom when I passed the Calculus AB exam. The field trip we went on yesterday, that was because I learned how to code. Teachers and teachers unions have been responding warmly to this new take on the performance pay debate. And we hope that we may have found common ground on this one sort of intractable issue between reformers and the teachers' union camp. Now, speaking of uh, finding common ground, I hope that uh, you and your constituents will use our site to find common purpose. Whether that is uh, using our platform to introduce new products or services directly to classroom teachers, or whether that's using our data to make discoveries about what teachers really need and what's on teachers' minds, or whether that's using our platform as a currency with which to incentivize and reward teachers for educational outcomes that you are focused on, I simply hope that you will use our site to see what you and passionate teachers can do together when gatekeepers do not stand in your way. Thank you for your time. And I think we're, we're, we're or, or I should say, I'm, I'm lucky enough, I'm, I'm lucky enough that we have nine minutes left for me to field questions from you, and I hope you'll, you'll hit hard with as many questions uh, as, as you have and as many questions as you like. And I wonder if there's, oh great, here we go already. I think I might need to take a look over here unless we can get it up on the peak monitor. Do you notice that people are supporting mostly projects from their local schools? Are they mostly parents? Such a good question. Uh, so 50% of the donations on donorschoose.org are made by donors who live within 25 miles of the teacher they're supporting, which is to say it's a donor who is loyal to their own community and is looking to support projects uh, in that community. However, they are almost always looking to support projects in their own community uh, on the other side of the tracks. 
all public schools can use our site, including middle and upper income public schools, where parents really are vital to supporting those projects. But in lower income communities, teachers see their projects uh, overwhelmingly funded by strangers and by people who live 10 states away, because fully half of the donors on our site are doing a search for Shakespeare, salmon, um, or uh, trash dance, and um, are, are finding projects that match their passion, even though they do not know uh, that teacher or live in that community. Thank you for that question. Um, all right, and the next one is, how are the administrative costs covered? What percent of money donated finds its way to the classroom? Also, awesome question. All this stuff I wish I had said in my remarks, you're now prompting, thank you. Um, when you support a classroom project on our site, you're encouraged, but you're not required, to allocate 15% of your donation to support our outreach and overhead costs. More than 80% of donors choose to keep that 15% allocation included, even though it's totally transparent, totally optional. And the income generated uh, by donors, including that voluntary 15%, now pays all of our bills. So we're one of the very few charities that is liberated from operations fundraising. It's been years since I've asked anybody for help with the rent payment, because we are a self-sustaining charity uh, by, giving, by letting donors choose whether or not they'd like to support our outreach and operating costs. Uh, and the next question, have you heard from any districts who express concern or frustration that projects are being supported that may not align with district goals or initiatives? We had some early tough experiences with this. I'll give you two anecdotes. In Chicago, there was a teacher who uh, put up a project on donors choose requesting dictionaries, and her project was very respectful of the school, but by requesting dictionaries, she was revealing that the school didn't have dictionaries. And the school principal told her that she would be fired if she posted another project on our site. That actually made us uh, both immediately jump to the defense of this teacher, but also excited to think of our site as a way for teachers to go public with unmet classroom needs that might otherwise be papered over. Uh, we had a few other experiences like that, um, and there are one or two districts out of 12,000 that um, have sort of like a, a knee-jerk reaction of like, if there's a book being delivered, we need to be in control of it, and it needs to go into our warehousing closet first. Uh, and those are a couple districts where um, it can be tough, and they do tell teachers they have to fill something out in triplicate before they're allowed to use our site. And of course, that stifles a use of our site. But what I think happens in 99% of districts, they look at the projects, at the more than 500,000 projects that have been funded on our site, and they are not, it, it, all the projects they see are are on mission, are on plan, are, are projects that they would never disagree with. And so we've been able to continue to give teachers a full freedom in our site. Next question, how do we create school cultures where faculty are empowered to think big? When we see schools that have a lot of teachers getting funding for a lot of projects, we, we uh, try to, and we need to do a better job of contacting each of those school principals and thanking them for creating a culture of teacher empowerment, of, of encouraging teachers to think big, to dream big, to be entrepreneurial. Uh, a lot of teachers use our site not just to get uh, fundamental resources funded, but to do super imaginative things. I was just looking at a, a project from a, a teacher in Michigan whose students, she's hatching native lake trout uh, fry with her students, and then they're releasing the lake trout, the, the baby lake trout, into uh, a lake which had been terribly polluted um, and where they want to um, uh, bring back native species. The question is whether the baby trout that they're hatching are actually using the reef that was installed in the lake to help these trout thrive. And so this teacher has requested two uh, underwater robots so that her students can actually watch the trout fry that they have hatched and see whether or not they are using the reef that was installed in the lake. And I give you this example just to illustrate that uh, teachers really are using our site to think big, to, th to, to uh, think outside the box, to be wonderfully imaginative. Uh, and, and we need to do actually a better job of applauding the school principals who've clearly created cultures of empowerment as expressed by the projects uh, that, that their teachers are creating. Do you get project proposals that are larger in scale than one classroom, a whole school, a whole district? The record holder largest project funded on our site was a teacher in a low-income community of Hawaii who's, uh, who um, 
was teaching at a school whose playground was in such disrepair that there was no recess outside. Can you imagine in Hawaii having no recess outside? And this teacher um, identified a, a maker of playgrounds uh, in Hawaii that could build a new playground for, I think it was $105,000. And we never thought that project would be funded. But um, it was by what I think was more than, it was hundreds of donors from all over the country, including a local Hawaii couple. And we don't encourage those projects. We, we actually uh, stay away from, we stay away from uh, salaries, under, like that we can't put up a project for, to underwrite a teacher's salary. And we stay away from capital construction, uh, with the rare exception of a prefabricated playground. Um, and partly the reason is that the citizen philanthropists who come to our site uh, may only have $10 to spare, and they want to feel like they're making at least a little difference with that $10. Uh, and we know that our teachers will be more successful to the extent that their projects tend to be in the $500, $1,000, $1,500 range. But uh, speaking of teacher freedom, uh, we, once a teacher has proven themselves on our site, if they want to take a crack at that $100,000 playground, they can do that. Okay. Um, I think with uh, two minutes left, we are going to end the party while we're still having fun, at least while I'm still having fun. Um, give you back two minutes of your day. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your time, for lending an ear, and for your awesome questions. Thank you.